Introduction to the Maxims of Methuselah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Maxims of Methuselah by Gellett Burgess. Introduction. The following is, so far as I know, the only authentic rendering into the English language of the 330 parables attributed to Methuselah. The authorship of these precepts was first traced to the aged patriarch by the Kabbalists, after having found by a transposition of the letters of his name the anagram he who prophesied in parables. Of its origin, the book, though freely rendered into the idiom of the hour, still bears intrinsic evidence of having been compiled by one who had had extraordinary experience with women. The amorous export will not find it hard to believe that 969 years would be none too short a time for any one man to have accumulated such a profound lore. Indeed, women tell us that the present span of life is entirely too brief for an ordinary man to obtain the slightest comprehension of the extreme complexity of feminine psychology. Men live and die without having acquired the rudiments of its categories. Methuselah himself, despite his unrivaled opportunities for investigation, could hardly have formulated so exhaustive a hand, or shall we say, heart book, without some help from his contemporaries. Moreover, that the author of these maxims had what passes for humor is plainly apparent from the jocosity of many of his verses, and this must be reckoned with in adjudicating Methuselah's claim to the honor. The patriarch undoubtedly had a dry wit, as historical evidence proves. Colin de Plancy, who says that every word that fell from his lips was superlatively perfect, narrates a legend of the patriarch showing this. On his 500th birthday, Methuselah, having lived out of doors all his life, was visited by an angel, who advised him to build himself a house. How much longer have I to live? the old man inquired. About five hundred years, replied the visitant. Oh, well, then, said Methuselah, I hardly think it's worth while for me to bother myself just for that little while. Regarding the origin of the text, a few words may prove interesting to the reader. While excavating several Roman sarcophagi of the second century, on my estate of Le Travalot in Provence, I came upon some twenty slate tablets covered with weather-worn cuneiform inscriptions. They had evidently been buried with the ashes of some centurion, or perhaps had merely been hidden in his grave. I do not myself read either Assyrian or Babylonian in the cuneiform, but my rendering has been made from a literal translation in which I have had the greatest confidence, and where the characters proved indecipherable, either from the erosion of time or my assistant's inexperience. I have not hesitated to supply the deficiency of the records with what I would myself have said had I the patriarch's felicitous advantages. With these important exceptions, a thorough investigation of the Talmud and other sources has compelled me to believe that these maxims are beyond peradventure the original parable spoken of by Fabricius. Granted, then, that the patriarch was the author, how came these precious tablets to find a resting place so far from the land of giants, where they were undoubtedly written? In answer to this natural question, I have to offer the following ingenious theory. Amongst other curious fables, it will be recalled by students of the lesser-known Oriental literatures that Methuselah died upon the day set for the inauguration of the flood, which was postponed for seven days that men might mourn the patriarch fittingly for a due season. Eusebius, it is true, places his death fifteen years afterward, but as he does not state where the patriarch found refuge while the waters covered the earth, his authority may be discredited. General opinion follows the Midrash. Rabbi Solomon asserts that Methuselah died seven days before the deluge, and the perk of Rabbi Eleazar, as well as the Jahut, confirm his testimony. As these maxims, prepared for the guidance of Shem, were delivered just before Methuselah's death, this postponement of the cataclysm gave the young man ample time during which to ensure their safe deposit in the ark. Now, curiously enough, the scriptures do not chronicle the death of Shem, although the statement is made that he lived for five hundred years after begetting Arphaxad. According to Eisenmenger, he was given the name 
Melchizedek, and the rabbi Gerson report seeing his last resting place in the land of Og, king of Bashan, in a grave eighty ells long. But other Talmudic legends narrate that he, with his brothers, fell asleep in a cave and did not awake till the nativity, when Shem, Ham, and Japhet appeared as the three wise men of the east. Leaving this repository with the brothers, after many years of hiding, the story would reasonably account for the presence of Methuselah's tablets in Palestine, from which place they were undoubtedly taken by the Romans at the fall of Jerusalem, and no doubt coming into the possession of some influential general, were carried by him into southern Gaul. The fact that the city of Arles, near which the tablets were found, has always been famous for its beautiful women, is highly suggestive, for the use of such information as the text supplied would be highly useful to any man who might settle in such a locality. Eleven apocryphal writings of Shem are known to exist, but I have been able to find no definite mention of these maxims in them to corroborate my theory. Fable welds another link in the chain which binds the oldest man to the book. Methuselah had a sword inscribed with the incommunicable name, Shem Hafarash, with which he slayed a thousand devils. The symbolism that convicts this lady killer is patent. Even if we take the statement literally, this proof of courage is not unworthy of one willing to antagonize the whole female sex by the unblushing impertinence of his maxims. Ab alio espetes altere quad feceres. As regards the women with whom Methuselah derived his knowledge, history and tradition show that he had a wide field for investigation. Besides the land of Nod, Uz, and the countries watered by the four rivers which flowed from Eden, the pre-Adamite theory exploited by Isaac de Pereira in 1655 would account for many more opportunities. The Oriental book of Hushshenk Name speaks of a race prior to the creation of Genesis, located upon the Isle of Musham, one of the Maldives. They had flat heads and were governed by a king, Dombak, who submitted to Adam when he was expelled from the Garden of Eden. Yet another authority lies in the book of Genesis itself, for the double account of the creation of woman in chapters 1 and 2 is by many supposed to indicate a double creation. According to the Talmud, Adam's first wife, Lilith, was cast out of paradise, and marrying with Eblis, the prince of darkness, became the mother of the Dijins, or phantoms, to whose influence Solomon owed his magical power. Greatly as the subject of feminine psychology and emotion has interested philosophers of all ages, the writings have been chiefly tentative and analytical rather than constructive. Women's ways have been avidly discussed, even smiled at, but except for these maxims, no scientific attempt has been made to embody in an organized manual man's discoveries in relation to women. Rules for the guidance of youth are much needed, however, and an instructive and specific textbook for the proper understanding and management of the fair sex should be in the possession of every young man desiring to attain proficiency in this greatest of all arts. The failure of experience to teach men is notorious. How much more futile is it to expect the callow youth to learn by mere experiment in a series of disastrous and pathetic essays? No, woman must be taken a priori or not at all. We must have some definite principle or hypothesis upon which to proceed in our love-making. Failure after failure has brought this fact home to most men, who, even if married, are still ignorant of the action and reaction in the feminine of cause and effect. Refined or crude as the patriarch's categories may be, and it seems evident that Methuselah gained the bulk of his knowledge from the commonest types of womanhood, no doubt the factory girls of the great brick foundries of the Euphrates. His principle of classification is sufficiently scientific. Naturalists and segregating species and varieties must rely upon differences of less anatomical significance than their selection would at first sight imply. In the same way, women do not differ from men in the larger characteristics of honor, generosity, unselfishness, and sapience, unless indeed the modern woman has in the impetus of her mental emancipation, outrun man, and, becoming more idealistic, has attained a positive superiority. At any rate, it may be safely held that men and women are more alike 
the higher they are cultured and the differences between the two must be looked for in mere trivialities and methuselah's justification for the light he has thrown upon woman's frailty lies in the fact that after all we love our friends as often because of as in spite of their faults no man would have woman less inconsistent less whimsical these are the charms that and if they amuse endear even the curious fact that what is universally true of women is universally funny also did not escape such a shrewd observer as methuselah woman is unfortunately characterized chiefly by her weaknesses and this fact is the basis of much of our modern humor not that men are not as weak or as perverse but their faults for some reason have never attained any real literary value in the eyes of the comic muse there are legends pointing to the fact that adam's first wife compiled a volume of reflections upon man's foibles and methods under the name of the lore of lilith and that a gospel of eve existed in the time of st ephanias is evidenced by his mention of it as having been in great repute among the gnostics the mussulmans also attribute to her a book of prophecies which it would be most interesting to substantiate but however just these may have been in their estimate of man's typical qualities and though scathing they undoubtedly were it is doubtful if either of them could ever be accounted as a humorous book it was no doubt the realization of this advantage of his sex that inspired methuselah to anticipate the inevitable to coque of women readers every age must however select its own illustrations of general principles from the life of its day and so although originally intended for a discussion of the peculiarities of the women of methuselah's period the maxims have been somewhat boldly adapted to the feminism of the twentieth century if it be inadequate to woman's latter-day ideals and concepts it can be said only that however women have changed in their own esteem since antediluvian times man's point of view in their respect has altered too slightly to affect the general utility of the patriarch's precepts the exigencies of the text therefore have at times compelled me to be much more harsh with woman's frailty and inconsistency than my own unguided and incomplete observation has seemed to warrant but i have been consoled by the fact that without doubt almost any statement one might make upon so broad a subject would be true while the direct opposite would certainly be as provable of any individual case and in my own modest experience all cases have been individual all exceptional still what is true of any considerable number of exceptional women ought to be fairly true of all women in the transcription of these maxims it might go without saying that much of the incisive epigrammatic quality of the original assyrian if it be assyrian has been lost but the epigram and the paradox as applied to woman's ways are media that have been sadly overworked of late and even the modern trope of the inverted or distorted proverb has lost its sting it has been the aim of my own not over modest attempt rather to be too true to be funny than to be too funny to be true as for this ideal the stilted phraseology of parable the redundancy and tautology of hebraic poetry and the solemn form of king james able literateurs has seemed best fitted women held no monopoly in iteration in the olden times nor should it be overlooked that much of the delicate asteism of the maxims is derived not so much from the patriarch's personal observation as from hints he has received directly from women themselves it is the first sign of woman's awakening sense of humor that she is able to perceive the illogicality of her own whims and the absurdity of many of her irresistible desires in a way this trait is the corollary of woman's dogma of her own inscrutability it is a symptom too not so much of treachery as of gathering intellectual and literary class consciousness which when the newer lore of lilith is written shall spit man writhing upon the point of her sharper more facile pen men will no doubt ignore and women contemn these maxims and however sapient and searching their message silly couples may often prefer to make their own deductions and analyses it is the pathos of experience that it can seldom be transmitted from father to son but i at least have done my part and i may say with spencer's cynical maid then let them love that list or live or die 
me list not die for any lover's duels nay list me leave my loved liberty to pity him that list to play the fool grave as it may be the accusation of sacrilege i shall not anticipate here except to acknowledge my indebtedness to certain literary flourishes in the book of proverbs but even king solomon could he have had the chance of reading this book aloud in his harem would i am sure have forgotten its impropriety in listening to the alternate sneers and giggles of his seven hundred wives princesses and three hundred concubines not to speak of the glee of other strange women together with the daughter of pharaoh women of the moabites ammonites edomites sidonians and hittites new york may first nineteen seventeen end of introduction section one of the maxims of methuselah this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Maxims of Methuselah by Gillette Burgess. Chapter 1. The Maxims of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, to know wisdom and instruction concerning women, to perceive the words of knowledge, whereby the damsels of his choice may be judged, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion in his loves the fear of women is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise experience and instruction my son hear the instruction of thy great-grandfather and forsake not the law of those who walk safely nor are distracted by women's ways so that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips shall win praise of women for the joys of thy life shall be many where thou goest she will gladly receive thee and when thou flirtest thou shalt not stumble for the days of my life are nine hundred sixty and nine years and i have known much women i counsel thee introduce not female contemporaries one to another verily keep thy loves apart for their wrath kindleth and bitter words arise when thy doings are made plain for to a woman all women are enemies yet men are allies one with another make no manner of personal remark to a woman unless peradventure thou wishest to hear it misquoted in thine ear for seventy and seven years withal forget in no wise to speak of her new raiment but remember also her attire of yore when thou first met her tell not thy previous loves to a woman lest she also telleth thee hers see that thou givest a maiden her way gainsay her in nothing howbeit if thou robbest the victory of all material advantage the glory will content her wouldst thou become acquainted with a damsel see that thou havest a secret with her straightway that when she seeth thy photograph she may smile and think untellable thoughts chapter two oh listen and hear my counsel hearken unto my precept for the maidens of the land of nod are known unto me and the damsels of uz are as rings on my hand teach thy son to love an older woman with his first love for he shall know much and come to no harm she shall teach him and he shall learn diverse things he shall amuse her and she shall train him in the way of women without entanglement yet if he wooeth a doll-like virgin surfeit him with her presence and make her ways easy so shall he peradventure fall aweary and learn discrimination verily men do foolish things thoughtlessly knowing not why but no woman doth aught without a reason search her acts and learn her follies explain not machinery to her on politics shalt thou keep thy mouth shut for she hath curiosity but of one thing which is love she writeth in the magazines she composeth verses yea she scribbleth much 
yet she publisheth only her own affairs and the affairs of her friends imagination is not in her she layeth her hand to her heart and exposeth its secrets my son a woman shall come unto thee saying hearken not unto the words of thy great-grandfather for he doteth he maketh a jest of women comprehending nothing he saith so and so concerning us but how about men is not this true even of them also then shalt thou know that she lacketh humour she floateth in her folly she is blind do not discuss with her kiss her patiently and praise her hair for a woman without humour is an annoyance she is as the touch of wet velvet or a mouse nibbling in the night she is as a cigar whose wrapper is torn and the air leaketh therein nothing can mend her i say unto thee it is easier to find a pet fly in a butcher's shop than a woman who can sharpen a pencil beware of the woman who exhausteth thine ammunition she shall make thee to be weary thou shalt tell her all thy secrets and yet learn naught of her thou shalt give her rich gifts and receive nothing thou shalt write her poems and be in no wise rewarded beware of a woman who signeth not her name to her letters she will bear watching ay she hath a past but she who dealeth in ciphers and symbols who hath her secret name for this and for that so that none but thee may understand her seek her and woo her for she hath cunning observe her ways and be wise curling locks are rather to be chosen than great riches and a good figure is better than diamond rings better is a dinner of macaroni where thou canst hear thyself think than a banquet of dainty meats with music and loud timbrels where her words escape thee in the tumult also that men see her blushes it is not good and he that sheweth her off in public places sinneth a reproof entereth more into a woman of sense than a hundred compliments into a fool the spirit of a proud woman may sustain a slight but a crooked nose-line who can bear the end of a flirtation is as when one letteth out the last gasp of a siphon but love endeth like the chianti flask its drops are bitter end of section one Section 2 of the Maxims of Methuselah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Maxims of Methuselah by Jellet Burgess. Chapter 3 Beware the wiles of women and curb thy vanity for by that door she entereth in to destroy thee out of the words of thy mouth shall she bring thee low i have watched her at her work in the cosy corner when she said lo for an hour i have made him to talk of himself till he thinketh he is the best ever now will i fall upon him and devour him he shall do my bidding for i have gotten him going he shall tell me his inmost thought and all that my rival hath said concerning me in my sleeve shall be heard the tinkling of silvery laughter he shall send me flowers precious confections and gloves and pins of fine gold theatre tickets and much cab fare her ways are ways of pleasantness she considereth man as a child she feedeth man's pride and nourisheth it and he groweth fat his chest protrudeth yet a silent man affrighteth her yea she is astonished at him she stumbleth and falleth down there is no way to work him i knew a man who lived in the city of enoch and he married a wife she was a shrew she complained much yet did he subdue her she railed continually with grievous plaints saying behold thou hast come in late and i am lonely long have i awaited thee and he said 
yes am so was her tongue broken against him and there was peace in his house my son obey the law and observe prudence when thou invitest a maid take her chaperone also that thou mayest flirt with her unafraid if thou hast called on her three thursdays take heed and avoid the fourth make thy call tuesday lest she thinketh she knoweth all thy ways bore her not with regularity let her expect thee alway let her not say unto her sister lo i have him on the string hast thou given the first kiss to a maiden write her speedily on the morrow before she giveth thee fierce words assure her and comfort her woe let her remorse be abated give unto her an excuse for her conduct lest she say lo i have spent the night in tears thinking on my shame sleep would not come nigh unto me i marvelled what thou shouldst think of me my sorrow is great because of my indiscretion chapter four yea as fascinating as a luth tooth is a secret to a young maid for she knoweth not whether to spit it out or keep it safe yet she cannot forget it catnip pleaseth the kitten and the reading of her palm rejoiceth the damsel even as one who fitteth a douce costume to a debutante so is he who clotheth a woman's vanity with pleasant prophecies she goeth to the sorcerer and the fortune-teller and she returneth with a marvel alway yea though she believeth not yet doth she believe and her lips are filled with wonders behold a damsel said unto me how well thou understandest me yet i knew not what she spake for she ended not her sentences but i held my tongue and forbore questioning therefore i was clad in wisdom he who spelleth ice cream upon her front breath shall be forgiven but whoso mentioneth her last night's indiscretion shall be despised better are two left-hand gloves than a man in the moonlight with the wrong woman and a maiden alone by the seashore is as a hat without a hat-pin she breedeth wild thoughts as a cushion which sheddeth its feathers as a molting dog which leapeth upon thee so is a woman who saith continually why desirest thou to kiss me to be two years a widow exceedeth a college education and a woman without brothers hath a hard time a teasing woman is as a squeaking shoe or as when one walketh on spilt sugar a wise maiden scenteth trouble afar and avoideth a scene but the foolish damsel exclaimeth don't a good woman would rather be the mother of a genius than the wife of a hero not by their strength do men prevail over women to have their way but by obstinacy and persistency for any man in time can win any woman it is not it is not saith the maiden but when he is gone his way she hurrieth to the mirror and rejoiceth at her beauty mark the woman in love how she beginneth a series of revelations yea though she be innocent of guile yet doth she not hide her good points from him she dresseth in a masquerade costume to her advantage she sheweth her ankle he surpriseth her in a fair morning gown and her negligee is not without peril she weareth the thin shirtwaist that sheweth pink ribbons beneath its folds she inviteth him to bathe at the seashore but when she appeareth with her hair braided when its plates fall down her back when the blue ribbon binds it then is her time come and danger is at hand end of section two section three of the maxims of methuselah this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Maxims of Methuselah by Gillette Burgess. Chapter 5. Prithee, my son, say not unto a woman, 
Beloved, why love I not thee? Why am I cold? For behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes, thou art clever and worthy my regard. Yet is my heart dead, for I cannot love thee. For her soul shall sicken at thy words, and a bitter thought shall come to her. Yea, two things shall persecute her in her meditations. For she will say, If he loveth me not now, then will he never love me. And it is my fault, for lo, I should have made him love me, and I could not. Clever men make their love in the same wise, one like unto another, with witty jest and with frankness displaying their wounds, confessing their danger and rejoicing in their peril, regarding themselves with humor. Beginning at the end of the flirtation, and proceeding backward from the inside outward, for in the game of love there is but one law, thou shalt make neither thyself nor her ridiculous. Son, mark the soft and oily lover, how women avoid him. His ways are devious and cunning, he covereth his tracks. He whispereth in the dark, he seeketh dim places. Yet will no thoroughbred endure him, for he putteth them to shame. Verily I say unto you, many a maid may be kissed in the open, who, when her hand is touched under the table, will cry, Nay, nay. A bold heart can conquer a princess, but he who seeketh her by craft getteth only seconds. A woman findeth in her last lover much of her first love, but a man seeth his next to the last love alway. Son, heed my instruction, and apply thyself to no women. Let thine eyes observe her when she is with another. For what she doeth with him, so will she do with thee also. Count no woman wise until thou hast received a letter from her hand. But love none thou hast not seen face to face. For she who is not foolish on paper is worth knowing. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But she who offereth to men thy glove shall be praised. Woo her not till thou hast seen her mother, for a score of years worketh wonders. Chapter 6 Wonder not at a woman's inconsistency, for she hath been created of warring essences. For she is the weaker vessel, yet shall not the strong enjoy her unless she consenteth. And that which she loveth must she refuse alway. She feareth a mouse when it appeareth, yet she goeth to fierce pains with gladness. She demandeth of men the impossible alway, yet she refuseth to see the side that appeareth not first unto her. Her ways are devious and full of guile, yet when she taketh the straight road she is reproved for her frowardness. Yea, when she entertaineth a fool with honeyed words, do men accuse her of hypocrisy. Yet if she telephoneth to men, asking them to call, then they are enraged and perverse of spirit. And in her defeat by her beloved is her only victory. She beareth agony continually, yea, she smileth and concealeth her pain. Yet if a man suffer, the whole city shall know it. There is a thing no woman knoweth, and all her days it shall be unrevealed. How she hath acted in private theatricals, no man shall tell her, and women shall say sweet words, meaning nothing. Son, if a maiden love thee, thou shalt appear handsome in her sight. She shall praise thine eyes and the corners of thy mouth. Yea, she shall admire thy hands. Though thou wert even as the orangutan, yet shall she paint thee with fancies. She shall be easy of access. She will accept all thine invitations. She shall have time in plenty. She shall show thee her new raiment, and ask thy judgment. And the gown which thou approvest not, she will not wear it. She shall ask thee of thy mother and thy sister. She shall demand a photograph of thy childhood. She shall read the books that thou readest. She shall study thy taste. She shall know thy color and thy song. She shall remember the sugar in thy tea, and the lamb chop thou despisest will she not offer thee. She shall pick threads from thy garment, she shall brush thine hair. She remembereth when she first met thee, and knoweth when thou hast last called. She laugheth at thy jests. She knoweth thy neckties, she heedeth thine opinions, and quoteth them to her friends. 
She giveth thee foolish gifts, and she knoweth if thou usest them not. She readeth thy letters even when they are cold. She knoweth thy step when it is outside the door. End of section 3「Section four of the Maxims of Methuselah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Maxims of Methuselah by Jellet Burgess. Chapter seven and eight. Chapter seven. Hearken unto my words, and attend diligently to my counsel, for the world is full of women, and the women are full of wile, so that a man, if he goeth not warily withal, shall surely fall a prey thereunto. For in the endeavour to misunderstand women we spend our most delightful moments. Take heed, and know that a fond woman's commandment is made only to be broken, and only a fool erreth therein. When she smileth, peradventure it may be for another, but when she frowneth, it is for thee alone. If she talketh much of another, rejoice that thou hast no rival, but if she keepeth silent concerning him, watch thou his acts, for danger lieth in wait for thee. If she weepeth, weep thou also, and her grief shall be abated. Many a woman hath said unto me, Lo, I am the universal confidant, and all men tell me their loves. Yet I have not confided in her. If a damsel importune thee for thy secret, lie thou straight away. Yea, if there be nothing to hide, invent thou a pleasing romance, for words shall content her. Yet if she ceaseth from her questions, if she respecteth thy privacy, then mayest thou tell her the truth. My son, beware of a plain damsel who charmeth thee, for she needeth much wile, and useth diverse weapons. She expecteth not to win easily, and she maketh sure her aim. She playeth the sympathetic. She studieth to please. She doeth many favors. But the fair maiden, is simple of heart, she thinketh much of herself, she giveth not, but receiveth alway, she basketh in her own beauty, she maketh men to be weary. Doth a woman strive for the impossible? Nay, she knoweth not the gain thereof, and she scoffeth at him who desireth a marvel. Lo, many a man hath given up a good salary for a chance of fortune, but a woman prefereth the bird in the hand. If thou makest a statement concerning women, lo, she shall immediately try to disprove it straightway. She goeth by contraries. When a woman breaketh her heart, when disaster befalleth her love, she entereth the house of memory, and shutteth the door behind her. But if a man slayeth his hope, he shuttereth the door also, but he departeth for all women are even as Lot's wife, looking backward. Chapter 8 O son, heed my wisdom and learn my ways, and maidens will follow thee. In Ethiopia shall the garlands be hung, and the damsels of Assyria shall say, He is a dear. And from the land of Nod shalt thou receive perfumed letters, and couch cushions, and photographs. Many a maid have I won by a quarrel, when flattery was in no wise helpful. But take heed that thou art in the wrong, so that thou mayest acknowledge thine error. Yet repeat not the manner of a flirtation, for lo, all the world shall hear of it, and women shall taunt thee, even the debutante shall revile thy ways. A poem to the foolish, and a conundrum to the wise a kiss to the chaste, and a hand-clasp to the unchaste. A man is like unto a fort in a strange land, easy to capture, but hard to hold. But a woman of virtue is like an eel in a bathtub, 
not easily to be acquired, yet difficult to lose. I say unto thee, verily, eschew competition, for if she loveth another more than thee, not of thy doing can vanquish him, and if she loveth thee not at first, then she will never love thee. While thine arm is about her, let it be as if other women were not. Mention them not, nay, ignore them utterly. Observe woman and her ways, and be not deceived by false tidings. For a woman may use a longhorn without being nearsighted, and not every one whose waist buttoneth up behind keepeth a maid. A woman liveth in a romantic future, yea, one which cometh not, but a man liveth in the present. Her heart consenteth before her lips say, Yea, and in this interval lieth her paradise, wherefore she would prolong it. She sendeth a telegram of ten words, nor more nor less can she be persuaded, though her need be great. She saith, Lo, I have washed mine hair, and I can do not with it. She saith, If thou hadst come on the yesterday, we had a good dinner. Why camest thou not last week, when mine house was in order? For now it is a sight. She saith, I pray thee, let us be honest one with another, and if thou ceasest to love me, tell me, and I will go my way. But be not persuaded. She saith, Lo, it is passing strange that my child behaveth not before company. When we are alone, then will he speak his peace. I have seen her when she watched the raiment of her sisters in the street, and in the house when she scrutinized their ways. Nothing escaped her. She turneth her head, she praiseth her neighbor's costume, saying, Lo, it is machine embroidered, and she weareth cheap lace, her shirt waist is not clean. Who is more virtuous than she who hath once kissed and hath ceased from kissing? She is impregnable. There is none like unto her. End of section four. Section five of The Maxims of Methuselah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Maxims of Methuselah by Jellet Burgess. Chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9. Tell me, ye simple ones, how long will ye go in for platonic friendship? And the scorners delight in their I told you so's, and the gossips whisper. I also will mock you at your calamity. I will laugh when passion cometh. When her tears flow, I will say, Ha ha! I will rejoice with exceeding great mirth. Then ye shall call on me, and I shall not answer. Ye shall ask my advice, and I shall withhold it, for there is none escape. Ye would none of my counsel, ye despised my precepts. Ye were as one who playeth with a live wire, and is become full of sparks. Therefore shall ye eat the fruit of your own way, and to be filled with your own devices. Ye shall squirm, uttering foolish lies, explaining nothing. But whoso hearkeneth to me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of trouble. Women shall say, How interesting! and shall much desire him. He shall be invited to theatre parties, he shall dine at no cost. The matron shall receive him with smiles. The wise shall enter into Upper Fifth Avenue, but the west side shall be the promotion of fools. In East Eighteenth Street shall they take up their abode, and a hall bedroom shall receive them. In Harlem shall they make their calls. Of women who could brook reproof have I known upward of a hundred, but of them that could discreetly take praise, nay, not one. Can a woman entertain a man and a pet at the same time? I say unto thee, one of the twain shall suffer jealousy. As the salt cellar whose cover cometh off in the soup, 
so is the matron who extolleth her babes even as the sound of sleighs upon bare ground so is she who saith i shall never marry attend unto my instruction that thou proposest not to the wrong damsel for i show thee revealing signs ask not her who trieth to get in ahead of the line at a ticket window neither to her who shutteth not the door of the car after her nor whoso spendeth her hours in the dressing-room of the pullman causing her sisters to gnash their teeth and say fierce things neither to her who knoweth not how to say good-bye at the telephone nor her who grafteth scarf-pins saying i will return it chapter x a black corset is an abomination and she who leaveth her hair in the comb shall be cast out into utter darkness count no matron happy until she hath passed thirty and hath not waxed fat for then do her sisters torment her saying in this gown thou needest have no fear it becometh thee but wear not horizontal stripes for thy hip increaseth behold no woman with a perfect figure shall escape calumny from her sex yea her reputation shall be questioned amongst her sisters and a good complexion is oft-times suspected in the mind of a woman to give birth to a child is the shortcut to omniscience for she who hath had children condemneth her sister who is not a matron yea she despiseth her in her heart wisdom and excellence shall not appease her my son waste no time in trying to fool a woman rather let her fool herself judge not a woman whether thou shalt marry her until thou hast seen her family bathroom and its appointments the sun must not see what the moon seeth nor the piazza chair know what the divan knoweth illume not with words of light the deeds of darkness go to the couch cushion thou tattler consider its ways and be wise which having seen and heard divers curious things telleth not nor will a slap on the face provoke it to indiscretion yet a woman and a mouse they carry a tail wherever they go son into my youth i kissed a maiden of assyria and she said unto me dost thou this alway with every damsel dost thou assuage thy desire then i waxed bold in my shame and made answer saying yea every one do i kiss and not one do i not desire her lips so she laughed and was comforted believing me not nor desiring to believe me she made merry at my jest and was content in her pride offer to every woman an excuse in season that she may clothe her embarrassment let her not suffer for her complacence end of section five Section 6 of the Maxims of Methuselah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Maxims of Methuselah by Gillette Burgess. Chapter 11. Unto a woman her conscience is a slave. She forceth it to do her will with what pride she vaunteth her virtue saying lo i know i ought not to tell this thing nor should i divulge it at all but thou understandest her friend cometh with tidings and she receiveth her with joy saying thou knowest that i believe not in gossip nor do i talk mischievously of my neighbour tell me therefore the news and i will not believe it she saith yea i know it well that i tell not always the truth and in her heart she thinketh surely my frankness condoneth my fault i have heard engaged maidens when they said concerning their past lovers yea i thought that i loved him but i was mistaken and many a damsel hath besought her sister to marry a man whom she would in no wise be persuaded to marry herself my son there are subjective kisses and kisses objective 
there are kisses seen and disgustable and kisses felt and rapturous but the glory of the subjective is one's and the shame of the objective is another's it is not by men that women are betrayed but rather by women lo i observed a prude among sports and the prude was a sport also even as the others fearing to be different from the rest and also i observed a sport amongst prudes her conduct was seemly altogether doth a woman smoke her first cigarette because a man asketh this of her nay but because the other women at the table smoke even at the dove lunch taketh she the first step yet the forward woman is she that is frankest she speaketh her mind doth a woman speak platitudes and hot air behold she is innocent every man judgeth a woman by his own experience alway if she refuseth him he saith lo she is inaccessible but if she consenteth he saith in his simplicity behold so doeth she with every man i say unto thee not by kisses and honeyed words doth a woman measure a man's love but by every deed he doeth she is sensitive to his approaches if he toucheth her glove she thinketh lo this is an advance his love progresseth he examineth her rings and she questioneth herself whether he be enamoured she whom thou lovest must laugh when thou laughest and cry when thou criest for if she laugh when thou criest or cry when thou laughest woe be unto thee my son wouldst thou flatter women i counsel thee avoid generalities say not unto her thou art fair my love thou rejoicest my heart with thy comeliness but let thy words be definite go thou into details for this will cause her joy say unto her love thy nostrils are proud they show thy cast and thine ear is like a sea-shell how cunning are the tips of thy fingers and the line of thine eyebrows naught can match it behold she knoweth her points good and bad knoweth she them all from the greatest even unto the smallest for her mirror instructeth her and she knoweth her frame the excellencies of her rivals she knoweth also and lo if she hath thick wrists of every other woman's wrists will she take notice she weareth a number three shoe for it is a comfort unto her yet when thou askest will she say lo a two and a half is my size knowest thou a woman who criticizeth not other women's attire i say unto thee there is not one who cannot point out their faults and advise them what they should wear though she dress like an art student yet she is an authority many a woman seemeth to be trying to convince thee yet it is but herself whom she would convince what is quicker than a woman's mind she leapeth to conclusions and the question thou asketh she answereth it not but what she thinketh that thou meanest that she answers she will not be pinned down as a fly entangled upon sticky paper so is a woman who seeketh to justify her conduct lo if thou speakest to her the whole truth she will say ha 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 he deceiveth me he hath not told me the half i will add unto it son say not unto a woman whom thou knowest not lo and beware thy side combs are falling and a hairpin escapeth from thy tresses it will invite her wrath she will look upon thee with fury she will turn a compliment into an insult in the twinkling of an eye when thou praisest her she will misconstrue thy words chapter twelve go to my son be not deceived by vain signs knowest thou a maiden who showeth all her letters to her mother cultivate her and she shall soon send thee words of fire even as the blower on the fireplace hideth the flames so shall she break forth when her parents scrutiny be removed if thou shalt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee all women shall be as one woman with thee and she easy seek one woman whom thou canst trust and to her who lovest thee best tell thy secrets she will deliver thee from the hands of strange women she will expose their craft and of her who flattereth thee will she make known the reason 
when thou findest her whom thou canst trust go but return alway smile upon her across the chamber when thou art encompassed about when women admire thee let thine eye seek her out across the dining-table shalt thou make her a sign she shall possess thy secret glance when thou puttest on gay raiment when thou anointest thine hair seek her ere thou goest thy way to the feast and when thou departest therefrom then shalt thou soon return unto her telling thy tale she will interpret thy dreams seek not to deceive her for she who loveth thee is wise and knoweth thy moods put thy trust in her and she will teach thee women's ways it is better to believe and to be deceived seventy times seven than to think all women are false yea it is more of forty if thou suspectest her it is better to leave her than to doubt but to believe and to doubt also it is a bitter torment in my youth i knew a maiden of the land of nod and i loved her and my friends came unto me and said lo she is a devil cast thou her off but i made answer saying verily i wot well that she is either angel or devil for no otherwise could she charm me yet would i think her an angel while i may for i cannot leave her the fool saith in his heart all women are liars but i say unto thee verily two good women friends are worth more than a million saints now i went into the chamber of a maiden and there were many photographs on the writing desk and on the mantel and the mirror thereof were many faces but i discovered not mine own and i rejoiced saying lo i am at the head of the procession and on another time i entered the chamber of yet another damsel in her abode i made my way privily and behold my photograph was displayed in a frame of fine gold and i cried aloud in my shame and waxed hot saying alas that i am become a gooseberry for she useth me to her own end i am as the geography of the schoolboy behind which she readeth the story of bloody mike the avenger for she wantoneth with my name fooling her friends End of section 6。section 7 of the maxims of methuselah。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by william jones。benita springs florida。the maxims of methuselah。by Gillette Burgess. Chapter 13. Hear now my word, and listen to my instruction, that thou be not fool of the woman who seeketh to ensnare thee. For her ways are plain unto me, and by many defeats have I won victory over her. For in my youth I had experience of the women of Mesopotamia, and of Ethiopia, and Assyria, and Havilah, and of the countries by the Euphrates and they taught me their lore yea one woman told of another and confessed her secret heart and on my tablets wrote i down their sayings my son keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee that they may keep thee from her who flattereth thee with honeyed words for lo this is her cunning and by these crafts doth she practise upon thee when she would bind thee to her side for ever. Ay, though she be innocent of guile, yet hath she her system, and it shall not fail. Behold, from my window I have regarded her, and I have beheld her ways, how she compasseth the fascination of the supple ones. From her first move unto the end of the game have I watched her out of mine eye and this is the manner of her doing she hath met him in a company of youths in the green fields and she hath espied her quarry she hath determined to capture him and he is already lost Aleph. she establisheth a personal relation she hath made him to notice her from amongst the others she hath asked him to carry her coat 
she hath put her purse into his pocket, and he doeth her service. Beth, she establisheth proximity, and of propinquity she hath made her use. She hath entreated him to tie her shoe, she hath decorated his buttonhole, and her breath is in his face. Gimmo, she hath awakened his protection, she hath shown her alarms that he might comfort her. For the dog that barketh and the cow with horns, they have provoked her fears. And lo, he is mighty, and stilleth her fears, she hath taken his arm. From a high place he hath lifted her down, even from the stone wall hath he lifted her, and she marvelleth at his strength. Daleth. She hath achieved a tete-a-tete, -tete, and she hath told him her confidence. She hath poured out her heart, saying, I know not why I tell thee this, for I have never told it before, but surely thou understandest me, and I can trust thee always. Hey, behold, he hath called for the third time, and she saith, Lo, I have missed thee, and all day yesterday thou wert in my mind, for I had divers things to say to thee. And when he goeth, she saith, When shall I see thee again? Vow. She establisheth a secret union between them, and in the company of strangers she saith unto him secret words. She referreth to untellable things, she buildeth up a past and useth it. She giveth him a pet name, she signeth her letters, the princess in the magic tower. Zane, she desireth to be treated as a man, she yearneth for the simple relationship of a comrade, saying, Lo, how I trust thee, for thou hast not regarded me merely as a woman, thou hast not made up to me. Yet doeth she the feminine and helpless always, she confesseth her weakness and extolleth his strength. She laugheth in her sleeve. Jeth. She sheweth an interest in all things which concern him. Of his doings at the office she inquireth, and of his comings and goings she displayeth concern, saying, And how was old Jones to-day? Did he trouble thee? And of that new customer in Peru, hast thou heard aught? She readeth the books he readeth. She consulteth the newspapers that she may discuss with him. And he saith, Lo, I have read that book which thou mentionedest, and I agree with thee perfectly. Thou art right concerning it. Teth. She getteth him into the kitchen. He openeth beer and sardines in the evening. She bindeth an apron about him, and she sitteth upon the wash-tubs. On the table she swingeth her silk stockings. She standeth beside him when he openeth cases. When he putteth up her shelf, she handeth him the hammer and the nails. She smileth upon him. Jod. She asketh for his photograph. I, for the photograph, when he was a babe, she manifesteth envy. She stealeth it from him. She admireth his shoulders. She saith, Lo, what a stunning profile thou hast. Thy mouth is firm. Behold, thou art distinguished. She inquireth of his mother and his Aunt Jane, and his little nephew, and all that are within his gates. Calf she attempteth his reform. She showeth an interest in his health, saying, Lo, I know well that it harmeth thee to inhale cigarettes. Why wilt thou not regard thy health? For my sake be careful. For if aught afflicted thee, then would my heart be bowed down. Yet it is not meet that I should stand between thee and thy pleasures, for I know not the ways of men nor of their needs. Far be it from me to restrict thee in thy enjoyment. Yet 
I beseech thee to wear rubbers, and warm underwear thou must not neglect, for thou must preserve thy strength and beauty. Lamed. Now seeth she his bachelor apartments where he taketh his ease, and she marvelleth at a man's liberty and freedom until she saith, Lo, would that I were a man also, and not a woman, for thy freedom maketh me to envy thee. Yet who doeth thy mending, and thy clean linen, who is there that layeth it out, who cleaneth up thy room? Who attendeth to thee when thou art sick? Who holdeth thy hand and smoothest thy pillow? For it maketh me to fear for thee. Promise me, therefore, that when thou art stricken thou wilt send for me, that I and my sister may visit thee, and do what shall be necessary for thy comfort, and we shall come gladly. And in her own house she sheweth him the contrast, she maketh him to be easy in mind and in body, she waiteth upon him with smiles, she adjusteth the sofa pillow, she placeth his smoking materials at his hand, she screeneth the light with a red shade, she giveth deft touches, and she saith, Lo, how lovely to be a man! Would that I were free also, that I might come and go unquestioned. I abhor the feminine touch, and man's simple taste, lo, I admire it. Yea, put thy feet upon the couch and be comfortable. Strew thine ashes where thou wilt, for it will keep the moths from the rug. And the fool thinketh in his heart, Would to God I had this comfort always, and my belongings ever ready at my hand. Verily it would be pleasant to be married, and a wife is a desirable thing. Mem. She deferreth to his taste, yea, she maketh him to go with her when she selecteth her hat, and that which she wisheth she forceth him to choose for her. She heedeth his words of praise concerning her attire, and the gown he doth not approve of she will not wear before him. She flattereth his neckties, she calleth his cufflings good. None. She provoketh a quarrel, yea, out of thin air she createth strife and disputeth with him, and when he is heeded, then doth she humble herself, saying, Lo, thou art right, let me grovel before thee, accept my apology, O Lord, for I am as nothing in thy sight. Upon her eyelash the teardrop trembleth, her lips are lovely with quivering, yet doth she not weep, nor do her eyes grow red, for there she draweth the line. She knoweth that she would be ill-favoured and it would avail her nothing. Samech, she asketh his advice, and she pretendeth to take it. She steereth him cunningly, saying, Lo, I am so impractical, but thou hast experience. Men and life are known unto thee, thou hast understanding. But I am helpless in mine ignorance and in matters of business. I know nothing. Counsel thou me. And when he hath spoken words of wisdom, she saith, Lo, how thou hast hope in me. What would I do without thee? Ein, she boasteth of her happiness and the simplicity of her relations with him, saying, Lo, I am a bachelor maid, I desire not to marry. I am contented, and a husband is not necessary unto me. Peh, when he feeleth safe concerning her, when he looketh upon her as his property, when he monopolizeth her easily without promise of marriage, then he hath grown contented. Then she springeth another man upon him, she dallieth with the handsome stranger, she is seen in the company of callow youths, yet doth she watch him privily, and her sisters tell her concerning him. Zadi She disappointeth him upon occasion, he calleth, and she is out, 
he cannot understand it, and his heart is oppressed. And when she cometh, she saith, Behold, I was detained. I simply tore to get here, yet it was impossible. I grieve for thee, for I did marvels that I might reach thee in time. Kopf. She committeth an indiscretion that it may bind them privily together. She relieth upon his honor. She is at his mercy and is fearful. Resh. She provoketh a struggle, and he snatcheth at her fiercely, and she saith, Lo, I thought that thou wert a gentleman. How darest thou impute such and such to me? What cause have I given thee? She accepteth his apology. Chin. She interesteth herself in the women he hath known. Lo, she praiseth them mightily. Extolling his discernment, she displayeth magnanimity and forgiveth him all things. Yet when she is sure of him, she pretendeth to be jealous. She accuseth him unjustly, making a mock of his friends. Yea, she leadeth him a life. Tau. Now summoneth she him to her abode for his finish. Her way is prepared, and the end is come. She springeth her last trick upon him, saying, Verily, verily, mine heart is trouble, and I need thine advice. Thou art mine only friend. Lo, I am invited to visit mine uncle in California for six months, and I know not whether to go or not. And he persuadeth her not to go. He proposeth to her, and she accepteth him. Give her then the fruits of her hands, and let her own works praise her, for she hath gotten her will, and brought him to submission. End of section 7「Section 8 of the Maxims of Methuselah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. The Maxims of Methuselah by Gillette Burgess. Chapters 14 and 15. Chapter 14 there be three things which are too difficult for me, yea, four things which I know not. The way of a woman with nerves, the way of a maid with her dressmaker, the way of a damsel bidding farewell, and the way of a matron who understandeth the speech of babes. There be three things which never satisfy a woman, yea, four which say not it is enough. Her photograph and the fit of her raiment a novel with a sad end, and the wooing of her lover. For it is easier to find a woman satisfied with her mirror than a maiden content with all her names. For Susan desireth to be called Hulda, and Sarah Deborah. Two things a woman saith on parting, yea, three speeches are necessary to her. Lo, I have had such a charming time, and it is so good of thee to have asked me, and now do come and see us. Hurry not a woman's favor, neither force her hastily to surrender to thee, for she goeth into love as she goeth into the waters at the seashore. First a hen, and then a lip goeth she in by littles. She diveth not, she leapeth not from the pier, but by gentle shocks and cries of protest she entereth slowly. Yet when the waters of love encompass her, then is she supported. She swimmeth in her joy, she floateth on the tide of happiness. For all her lines are drawn in pleasant places. Son, when thou callest upon a damsel for the first time, see that thou goest alone, for a first call often bringeth forth a miracle. Hunt not in couples, lest thou gettest not acquainted eschew letters of introduction which are the methods of fools be sure she desireth thee and visit her alone 
she will receive thee willingly. The fool trieth a maid with wiles before he kisseth. He touches her hand privily, he sitteth more near. But yet a bold one feareth not. He jumpeth up, he runneth across the chamber, and falleth upon her with suddenness, ere she is aware. She is astonished. And she slappeth his face. But the man of understanding eateth a sign. It is revealed to him what he shall do. When he becometh three parts sure, then he proceedeth. For the three parts are even this damsel, and the fourth is all women. No man knoweth how another man maketh his love, for women tell not. But women know well of women's ways. If a man love, he telleth much. Though a woman be as honest as a child before company, yet will she lie to the man she loveth. Chapter 15 If a woman confesseth that she love thee, and thou lovest not her, leave her not, forsake her not in her anguish, make her to laugh, and let thy conduct be merry. Yet when she saith, I have repented of my folly, forget thy pride and be glad. Remind her not of her words, be thy mouth shut upon her weakness aforetime. Some women are to be captured by storm, and some taken by siege. Yet if there be not a traitor in her heart that shall deliver up the garrison, thou shalt not prevail over her. I say unto thee, verily, not every woman that looketh like a maiden going to a tea is a typewriter, for some are maidens going to a tea. If, when thou callest, a woman asketh thee concerning thy goings in, and comings out, and what thou doest, take heed, for she thinkest of other things, she prepareth herself to work thee. I have watched the rivalry of maidens at the summer hotel, yea, at the seashore I have regarded their strife. Yet could I not judge a damsel's popularity by flowers she received, for verily it may be her mother who sendeth them, and the old man footeth the bills. For the rivalry of women is visited upon their children to the third and fourth generation. Son, be not deceived by the undemonstrative, for a woman of ice may desire to be wooed with ardor, and she who standeth apart hath her own opinion of the laggard lover. Propose not to a woman when she hath gotten a new frock, nor when she is puffed up with victories. When she reigneth and rejoiceth in her hour of triumph, come not nigh unto her. But when she be ill or weary, when she is cast down in spirit and needeth a comforter, then be thou ready and make thy suit. After she hath walked far and resteth, while the storm gathereth, and the thunders are loosed in the heavens, while she listeneth to fair music, when the wine-cup is emptied, then shalt thou have thy way with her. And a wedding in haste is worth two at leisure. If she dresseth her hair in a new fashion, some one hath great influence over her, and if he shaveth his beard, there is a reason. When a damsel becometh engaged, lo, she breaketh many charms, and her lifelong friends discuss her. Yea, her dearest sisters laugh and whisper in scorn. Is her ring wished on? Peradventure it may be, but to test thy strength. Who can withstand a maid of ten years? Behold, she hath many uncles. End of chapters 14 and 15「Section 9 of the Maxims of Methuselah」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Garfield D'Souza the Maxims of Methuselah by Gellert Burgess Chapter 16 Even as one who wipeth his hands upon a new towel, as fly-paper to the bare feet, 
so is a woman who asketh thee continually if thou lovest her. Gum may be removed from the hair, and ink under the thumbnail will in time pass away. But she who talketh too loudly in the street car cannot be changed. A maiden's first kiss cometh hard, yea, it is as a first olive out of a bottle, requiring much skill. But the rest are easy. As a hot drink on a sleigh ride, so is a woman who asketh not troublesome questions. The education of a fair damsel is pleasant, yea, it rejoiceth the heart of man to give counsel to her and to teach her in new ways. A man may be square because of the opinion of his brothers, but if a woman be white, she alone is to be praised. Son, when art thou old, it will please thee more to remember the duties thou hast neglected for love of woman than all thine honours. The bachelor thinketh he understandeth woman, knowing a little of many, and the husband is wise in his own conceit, knowing much of one, but a woman holdeth them equal in folly. Even as one who putteth the mucilage brush into the ink bottle, so is he who saith unto a woman, Beloved, how young thou lookest today, how well thou appearest, when she enjoyeth not all people, when she scanneth her mirror in the morning, when she seeketh the youth of the land to enslave them, these are the stages of her ageing. Who is more staid than the damsel of twenty-three? Lo, she scanneth the world, she writeth cynically in her journal, she spitteth the ashes of joy from her mouth, she talketh wisely to the old men and scanneth babes. Yet in another year she returneth to embroidered lingerie, she danceth the two-step with ardour, she writeth many letters. O oh, marvellous are women's ways, and most wonderful are her economies. On cheap underwear, and on cheap stockings, and cheap boots, she economize it. Yea, from the bargain counter she selected her gloves, but on her hats she throweth her substance away. But at the markdown sale there are no whales found. The thoroughbred is wonderful to me, but a cheap woman is an abomination in mine eyes. She weareth a solitaire moonstone ring, and she cleaneth it not. She weareth a fascinator ever upon sleigh rides. She keepeth three hats going, yea, their progress is relentless. As scarlet changeth to mauve, and mauve changeth to magenta, so her hats change all way. For last year's best becometh this season's everyday hat, and this year's everyday becometh next year's rainy day hat. Yea, though it be of blue tulle, Withal, its course is fixed, and change it not in its progression. She put it on an old silk waist for her housework, and the fresh morning gown knoweth her not. Her white gloves are soiled all way, and the button leaveth her boots. She weareth Louis Quinn slippers that are run over at the heels. She hath a hole in her stocking. Her Jaegers bulge at her shoe tops. Her placket Cape it open, causing men to turn away their heads. Chapter 17 Who can find a consistent woman? Where is she who spitteth not secrets in her rot? When thou hast quarrelled with her, and she hath not belied thee to thy friends, then mayest thou say, She is a gentle man, yea, she is whiter than snow. The damsel yearneth for chivalry, but the matron desireth impertinence and no woman answereth an important question in less than eleven score words. My son, wouldst thou know woman? Incline thine ear unto my sayings, for the women of the Pishon are like unto those of the Gihon, and what the damsels of the Hidical think, so think they of the Euphrates. She is like a stone on the hilltop, difficult to be moved. Yet when she is once started, she goeth fast and far, no man knoweth her end. She believeth that all men are vain and easy to be flattered. Suffer her then in this belief, that she may discover to thee her cunning, her ways shall be made plain. Her heart is older than her head, yea, her emotion is the mother of her reason. She remembereth anniversaries even to the day thereof, and by thy memory shall thy love be measured. She desireth many things, and she is happy till she getteth them. Two things she holdeth dear, mystery and mastery. 
Two things she cannot resist in a man. Sentiment, for she hath it in store, and honesty, for she hath not of it. She holdeth a comely youth is he who knoweth it not, and a subtle man is one who provideth her with good excuses. She jesteth not at love until her heart be broken, and an unmarried damsel getteth much experience. End of section 9「Section 10 of the Maxims of Methuselah – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Garfield D'Souza – The Maxims of Methuselah by Jellet Burgess Chapter 18 – On the banks of the Tigris, I came upon a pair kissing. Of a sudden I caught them unaware, and I marvelled. For the woman was as bold as a lioness with her whelp. Shame was not in her, but the man was embarrassed, yea, he was much rattled. And I spake to the damsel, saying, Wherefore art thou not ashamed? And why dost thy heart beat not? And she answered, saying, Lo, when he first kissed me, then was I full of shame, and my heart beat sore. I cast down my head. But now it is over. Behold, I have succumbed. My heart hath surrendered utterly, and I care not. Can not lose all twice? In that day was I ashamed because of my defeat. What worse can befall me? Though thou judgest me, I care not, neither am I ashamed, for I have judged myself. For I fear myself only, and by mine own eyes was I discovered. Now there were four women by the river Tigris, and to each of them I lent fifty shekels. And the first damsel said unto herself, Lo, I will not repay him, for he is richer than I, he can afford it, and she paid me not. And the second damsel said, Lo, said he not that he was in no hurry? Some time will I repay, but not now. And she made no mention of her debt, neither did she ever pay me. And the third damsel suffered much, for she was in hard luck. So she came to me, saying, Behold, much would I like to repay thee, but I have not the wherewithal. Yet have I not forgotten thy kindness to me. Surely I will pay thee on Monday. But the fourth damsel paid me in full measure. On the next Saturday discharged she her debt. Behold, there was a married woman, and she had a friend. And her husband knew him, and regarded him not, being exceeding fond. And on a day the young man wrote to the matron, saying, Come thou to lunch with me on Wednesday, and we will eat together. At the restaurant will I meet thee. So she met him, and they lunched together, and their discourse was virtuous and without evil. But that night she said to her husband, Lord, today as I walked in town I happened to meet my friend, and he invited me to eat, and I went with him. And her husband said, All right, and he opened his paper. For in a woman's eyes a lie is but a half-truth. Chapter 19 My son, wouldst thou flatter woman? Observe my wisdom, and be not afraid with sudden fear. For a woman is as a foolish conundrum, having no answer. Talk seriously with a silly damsel, but with a wise virgin mayest thou be light-minded. And the matron shall thou call impudently by her given name, that she forget her years. Praise not a woman for what she hath, but for what she hath not, and thy reward shall be exceeding great. A witty woman for her beauty, and a comely damsel for her intellect, a wise woman for her jests, and a frivolous maid for her literary criticism. A pianist for her cookery, and a housewife for her mathematics, so shalt thou praise them. But the mother of one babe shall be flattered through that alone, for there the straight way lieth. For I give thee good doctrine, forsake not my law. Unless she telleth thee all she knoweth, the uttermost love is not in her, and she shall escape thee privily. When she giveth thee many reasons, lo, she can be persuaded. If she giveth thee but one only, cease thy supplication. When she sees it from calling thee by thy surname, when she calleth thee you, 
Then be on thy guard, for this is the end of formality. When she leaded thee on to talk of thyself, she had one of two motives withal, admiration or contempt. Judge not a woman's beauty in the street by the back of her head, lest the wise man scorn thee. A flattering deed is worth many compliments, and a pleasing letter worketh wonders. Two kinds of women there be who smoke cigarettes, she who wisheth to, and she who wisheth to. When she is least sure, she is most decided, and a stubborn woman is oft times mistaken. Until she sendeth thee these words, thou hast not won her. Three letters have I written thee, and burned them with fire, for my heart misgave me. She who is engaged to thee should have none other engagements. My son, ere thou takest thyself a wife, engage her in a game of poker, and much shall be revealed. Hear the instruction of a lover, and attend to no understanding. For of women have I known upward of five hundred, fifty and five, in the days of my youth, and my fame was mighty in the land. If thou wouldst be a judge of woman, the worst as well as the best shouldst thou know. For the woman who wore a sleeve is even as she whose heart is blackest, and the angel and devil are as sisters to one without experience. For wickedness veareth the cloak of innocence, and the baby stare gazeth from the froward woman's eyes. She hungereth after the callow youth, she studieth his ways, and walketh humbly. She pretended to be shocked, she casteth down her eyes, she delighted to be instructed. She laugheth in her sleeve, she amuseth herself with his innocence, and when he is gone, she telleth his follies. End of section 10. Section 11 of the Maxims of Methuselah. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Maxims of Methuselah by Jellet Burgess. Chapters 20 and 21. Chapter 20. Every way of a maid with a man is subtle. Yea, it is exceedingly wise, as she worketh her new garments, sewing upon the inside, so it may not be seen from the outside, so she worketh him. And when her work is completed, she entereth, and taketh possession. I observed her on a dark night when she walked abroad with her young man, and she wore not her white shirt-waist, nay, it was of somber hue, that men might not see her. For she had seceded not in her wiles upon the golf links, nor in the ballrooms, nor upon the piazza, for he feared her much. Yea, he was timid, being simple and free from guile. But she said in her heart, Lo, what shall I do that he may be emboldened? I will lead him beneath a tree to rest in its shade, and I will sit beside him, meekly. And it was a dark night of stars, having no moon. Then said that damsel, I would that there were a moon, so that it might shed its light upon us. And he answered her, saying, Thank heavens there is not a moon, and he drew nearer. And she smiled to herself, saying, Now is my time come, long have I awaited. Now there were three damsels sitting on three chairs, and each damsel had a youth beside her, and each youth placed his arm along the back of his damsel's seat, privily, and each damsel observed his act, keeping her counsel. And the first damsel waxed wroth at the youth's impertinence, and she leaned back. Then with her eyes she darted fierce glances at him, so that he was rebuked, and he took away his arm. And the second damsel was rejoiced in her youth's ardor. She leaned back and enjoyed herself, and the young man withdrew not his arm. But the third damsel knew not whether she was pleased or whether to wax wroth, for she was one without experience. So she made no sign, pretending not to notice and she sat erect all the evening, suffering. Like the alarm clock that goeth off at seven a.m., so is she who saith, I told you so. But a woman who dallieth and is tardy, she is like an upper step which is not upon the stair, causing one to be vexed. And I called upon a matron. At her house I paid my visit, and I found a bore thereat. 
and he stayed while his back was turned she yawned in her kerchief wishing he might take his way and depart for she desired much to be alone with me and it came to pass that after many hours he arose to depart yea he took his hat and stood talking and lo the matron began to gush mightily with gossip telling him tales with many words she beguiled him so that he stood upon one foot and then the other striving to say farewell and she talked an hour seeking to conceal her shame and i wondered mightily chapter twenty one now at the window of mine house i looked through my casement and behold a table spread with men and women sitting thereat and lo every woman flirted with her neighbour and the men flirted with them two and two flirted they until the coffee was served and i regarded them and every woman watched the other woman privily and made note of their progress who were in love and who were in boredom and who quarrelled with all out of the corners of their eyes they observed all things that were done at the table but they made no sign they flirted continually but behold the men were as blind each regarding his partner and none other he attended each to his own affair he looked straightly minding his business and in no wise observing the others at the table now coffee was served and the women left the men going up to their apartment and to the mirrors thereof and behold the women gossiped one to another of the men saying untruth and they questioned each other withal and called their rivals honeyed names and they waited for the men but lo the men smoked together and took their ease holding wise converse but no men talked of the women in that house nor mentioned the name of any woman nor spake they one of another's flirting and the time went merrily withal no man desiring to leave the table nor the cigars thereof for the host spake saying it is time for the ladies await us then went the men into the drawing-room of that house slowly and the women awaited them with smiles watching the door seeing who would be captured and she who was upon the couch in the drawing-room made room for the guest of honour and he came and sate by her basking in her light and the other women smiled saying nothing yet their brains coined swift thoughts give her then the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the congregations of the elect for such is the way of a woman she winketh or sheddeth the tear and saith i have done no wickedness seeing that in her eyes there is but one thing worth considering whether it be her love or another's the words of methuselah son of enoch in the nine hundred sixty and ninth year of his age to his great-grandson shem at his coming of age that he might know women and be instructed in his loves selah end of section eleven end of the maxims of methuselah by jellet burgess